and hasn't eaten. I'm now facing an audience that's absolutely pissed and totally stuffed. And I've got to try and keep you from slide, sliding down the uh, levels of the Glasgow Coma Scale. So basically, there's a shiny sixpence for anyone who's still got brainstem reflexes at the end of my talk. So there you go. So, uh, yeah. I'm going to talk, was Schubert a musical brain? That's the question I've posed. And I want to begin with a rather nice quote. It's from the Austrian playwright Franz Grillparze, who asserted in his funeral oration for Schubert that here we bear a very great treasure and greater promise. But he didn't know half of it. The definitive catalogue of Schubert's compositions lists nearly a thousand items. He's one of my favourite composers, by the way. It will probably show. Amongst them, perhaps the greatest song titles ever written, seven completed symphonies and three incomplete ones, including, of course, the great unfinished. Then the incomparable late piano sonatas, and, well, I could go on forever. A quarter of Schubert's output would have sufficed to establish him as a major figure in Western classical music. And yet he lived for little more than a decade after he came to musical maturity. His last year, when he was scarcely into his 30s, and probably knew he was dying, was, as Benjamin Britten has plausibly claimed, the most miraculous year in the history of Western music. The Great Symphony in C, the Schweinegesang Lieder, the last three piano sonatas, and the peerless string quartet in C were only some of the highlights. Now, almost by definition, the art of a genius is underdetermined by the life. But with Schubert, the mis mismatch between life and work seems particularly extreme. The twelfth of fourteen children, of whom only five survived, this quintessentially romantic composer was physically unattractive. A short-sighted and stocky dwarf, the little mushroom, as he was described, was rejected as totally unserviceable by the military selection panel. His love affairs were one-sided. Not one woman he truly loved returned his feelings, and yet he was not a misogynist. He was forced to earn a living in uncongenial ways, but he was not embittered by a sense of entitlement. While he was recognised in his immediate circle, and even a little bit beyond, this was scarcely proportionate to his achievement. To the very end, he could not guarantee that even commissioned work would be accepted, and most of what he wrote was not played in his lifetime. For over half of his magnificent final decade, he was ill with syphilis, compounded by the ghastly side effects of mercury, which is even worse than syphilis. Now, given such an unpromising outer life, those who cannot tolerate the inexplicable have turned to his inner life to explain his torrent of masterpieces. Psychoanalysts, of course, have been on the case. But we may re entirely reject their one-size-fit-all explanations that see the same processes, tensions and dynamisms in all of us. They offer nothing to help us understand how a man could complete the B-flat piano sonata with its soul-freezing and at times terrifyingly beautiful 25-minute opening movement a few weeks from his death, while coping with the unromantic misery of headaches and vomiting and stomach pain as the spirochetes working their way through his body were joined by typhoid. But the appeal to unconscious drives dies hard. Doctor and musician Roger Neighbour has offered a more customised psychoanalytical explanation. He notes in his essay, The Little Mushroom and the Blighted Twin, that Schubert was much smaller than his siblings, and he speculates that he'd suffered intrauterine starvation as a result of competition from a twin brother who died in the womb. This early catastrophic bereavement accounted, he argues, for an emotional precocity and a depth of feeling that Schubert's rather ordinary and generally cheerful early life would not justify. An aband abiding sense of loss and inc incompleteness prompted so Dr. Neighbour says, a compulsive search for the missing other half. He goes further and connects the death throes of Schubert's womb mate with the dactylic rhythm, long, short, short, long, short, short, heard so often as in Death and the Maiden or The Wanderer of Fantasia, and the sudden volcanic eruptions that sometimes inexplicably break into sunny lyricism. The image of Schubert, haunted by months spent sharing an intrauterine bed with a dead twin, has a gothic power. But there are many reasons for dismissing fetal memories as an explanation of his achievements. The most obvious is the conscious care, the attention to detail, 
that was essential to Schubert's work. He took lessons in counterpoint just a few weeks before he died. Nothing could be further from a primal scream than the endlessly worked over final sonatas, which reveal the death-haunted man to be a highly self-critical artist. The appeal to deep psychological forces, whose consequences one would expect to be untidy, to say the least, misses the transcendent craftsmanship that is the necessary condition of genius. The search for solutions to problems that only the artist can see. The transformation of seemingly simple melodies that appear from nowhere. The willingness to learn from revered masters, most notably Beethoven, and from one's own failures and successes. And that infinite capacity for taking pains that Thomas Carlyle spoke of. These are closer to the essence of Schubert's genius than unresolved emotional conflicts. <coughs> Besides, the appeal to early trauma to explain artistic genius does not withstand the observation that childhood trauma is all too common and great artists all too rare. While the joy of creation may help artists to come to terms with themselves and their world, their works move us only because they transcend any private forces that may drive them. They address, or dress, the universal wound of the human condition that ultimately derives from our having been born for insufficient reason into a sometimes hostile world and are consequently fated to die after a life of incomplete meanings. Psychological disturbance is not of itself much help. Besides, the reliable image we have of Schubert is of a man of striking sanity, generous to his friends and convivial when he was not prostrated by illness. We get more enlightenment, though nothing that comes anywhere near an explanation, from looking at the culture of the city which Schubert shared with Beethoven, with a, a father who appreciated music, and teachers and friends who early acknowledged his talents, from looking at Schubertiads rather than putative brain modules automating creativity. But even attempts to account for Schubert's genius by looking at the world in which he lived his short life have all the vices of a post hoc explanation. As I've already mentioned, Schubert's circumstances hardly favoured his sublime creativity. If they were sufficient to explain what he achieved, we would have had hordes of Schubert's produced by these circumstances. The truth is that no explanation appealing to psychodynamic forces, prenatal experiences, or historical circumstances can get close to the utter singularity of the man who produced such a wonderful body of work in which profound feeling and technical brilliance are effortlessly reconciled. Indeed, are inseparable as a recto and verso of a sheet of paper. All explanations have to appeal to general factors in order to seem persuasive or even to be intelligible. And there is absolutely nothing general about Schubert. But the ache for explanation persists. In a world enthralled to neuroscience, those who state, as a friend of mine did many years ago, that Schubert's genius is explained by the fact that he had a musical brain <laughs> are parroting what is now orthodoxy. This is net in yet another expression of the general expectation that human beings will ultimately be explained in terms of the activity of their evolved brains and that the combination of neuroscience and evolutionary theory will bring us closer to understanding what human beings are and in particular the extraordinary phenomenon that is music. The brain research will explain the creation and appreciation of music, how Schubert came to be such a genius, and why his music gives us such pleasure, pleasure so profound that they change our lives. It's important to discuss this because we need to think about ways in which the spectacularly successful scientific enterprise, including neuroscience, and its vision of the world, can be reconciled with other, no less important ways of understanding our lives and our human nature that come from the humanities and more importantly, from the arts. This is the great cognitive challenge of the 21st century, and it's important, therefore, to head off myths that get in the way of meeting that challenge. Now, I'm sure there are places where science and the arts can cast light on each other. They are, after all, both products of human beings at their most awake, at their most inspired. But those places lie very deep, and we won't find them if we don't dig deep enough if we use somewhat crude science to understand greatly simplified arts, in particular music, as we see in contemporary neuroaesthetics, the theme of this talk. It will be difficult to exaggerate the importance of music in our lives, or perhaps I'm speaking autobiographically in my life. 
When Nietzsche said that without music, life would be a mistake, he was exaggerating, but only a little. And its profound mystery casts light on the mystery that is ourselves. It goes to the bottom of our humanity. There is a deeply moving passage in Kafka's Metamorphosis, that terrifying story in which a man wakes up one day to find he's been turned into a beetle or some sort of insect. Towards the end of the story, he overhears some music. And noticing how much it moves him, he thinks to himself, could I still be an animal when music so captivated me? Man, perhaps, is the music-making animal, at least as much as he is the talking animal. This must be why the music maker has always had a special place in society, highlighted by the anthropologist, Claude Lévi-Strauss. In The Raw and the Cooked, he said, Music is a language by whose means messages are elaborated, that can be understood by the many, but sent out only by the few. It unites the contradictory character of being at once intelligible and untranslatable. These facts make the creator of music a being like the gods, and make music itself the supreme mystery of human knowledge. So there is a challenge. Now how does neuroscience, or more particularly the young science of neuroaesthetics, shape up in meeting this challenge? Very poorly, I will argue. I'm going to spell out why, though I emphasize that my purpose in doing so is positive, not negative. At the very least, I hope that by highlighting the deficiencies of neurobiological approaches to music, I will highlight the extraordinary nature of music, and indeed of man, or indeed woman, the music-making animal. But let me begin with neuroscience research into the appreciation of music. This has many dimensions, but let me start on the ground floor, as it were, with research into the perception of musical sounds. Using methods of recording brain activity, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography scans, researchers claim to identify the different brain areas responsible for detecting and responding to pitch, to harmony, to melody, and other aspects of music. For example, we're told that tempo activates areas in the parietal, insular, frontal, and prefrontal cortex. And the area said to be associated with pitch perception is located, as you can see on the slide, in the superior temporal gyrus. But does this tell us anything about the experience of music? I think not. And it's interesting to consider why it doesn't. At the most basic level, given that we are not in real life served up these elements, pitch, harmony, tempo, and so on, independently, we learn little about the perception of real sounds. Less about the perception of real sounds in the bubbling mess of the real world, and even less about the experience of music, and less still about the impact of great music in our lives. At the very least, we experience melodies as a whole. We don't separately experience pitch, or tempo, or tonality. What's more, we all have brains that function in roughly the same way, but we don't all experience the same melodies in the same way. <coughs> Tastes from person to person, from group to group, from age to age, vary. More to the point, we don't always experience the same melody in the same way. My sensitivity varies from time to time, within an hour or a day. Listening and re-listening, tenth listening and a thousandth listening, are different experiences, and context is all. That context may include knowledge of the composer, or of the tradition from which he or she was drawing. Whether you're listening intently in a concert hall, or overhearing the music as you drive down the motor motorway. I want memories or associations, a familiar piece of music they awaken. Now, not all studies have focused on isolated aspects of individual musical sounds. Some have indeed looked at the response to whole melodies. The findings here are conflicting. Arundo Patel, a leading researcher in the field, asserts that music engages everything above the neck, Robert Sator, another well-respected figure, however, argues that there are specific effects of music on particular parts of the brain. For example, the famous shiver down the spine. Sator and his colleagues use PET scanning to look for correlations between the intensity of the pleasure given by the music and the blood flow in different areas of the cerebral cortex as a measure of neural activity. And you'll be delighted and illuminated to know that they found that when the shivers were felt down the spine, 
the following areas lit up. <laughs> ventral striatum, amygdala, orbital frontal cortex, and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. These names may not mean all that much to you, but they certainly ring a bell with neuroscientists and indeed make them salivate in the Pavlovian way. <laughs> because these same areas or circuits that involve the neurotransmitter dopamine are active in response to other euphoria-inducing stimuli, such as food, sex, and drugs. In other words, any old motivations, any old reward. And many neuroesthetics think that this is a revelation. We've found the secret of music. It's rewarding because it stimulates the reward centers, where dopamine pathways are found in abundance. In fact, this banal finding is worse than banal. It's embarrassing because it betrays how little is revealed by looking at the brains of people enjoying music. Ladies and gentlemen, a science that can't tell the difference between a response to music, drugs, and sex, to getting a hit of bark and getting a hit of cocaine, or between hearing the organ played and having your organs played with, <laughs> says little about either. Surely scientists should wonder whether they are missing something. The discovery that that thrilling master of Renaissance polyphony, Palestrina, and the punk rocker Sid Vicious are doing the same thing, and that the like the purveyor of soft pornography, Hugh Hefner, and the cocaine, cocaine baron Pablo E, I won't give his full name because it's being recorded, they are fellow pushers of stimuli that tickle up the dopaminergic or reward pathways. Surely this should discredit this approach. Now, we may set aside the excuse that this is merely early days yet, don't be impatient, and that refinement of techniques will bring more consistent and illuminating results. Because as we've seen already, neuroscientific approaches to music involve both teasing apart things that belong together, teasing out pitch of notes out of the whole experience of music in a real setting, and clumping together things that should be kept separate. Bach and Hugh Hefner and Columbia and Marching Powder. So we're unlikely to gain much in our understanding of music, even if the present techniques were refined so they could precisely pinpoint the locations that light up in response to different components of music. This would cast no light on the singular joy that melodies may bring and the ineffable difference between great music and that which is merely competent, between sublime and cheap music, between music that makes you feel and think differently about the world and a few nice tunes, or between what music means to us and what part musical sound plays in the natural world. Behind the neuroscientific investigation of music is the belief or presupposition that music affects us by virtue of exploiting existing biological mechanisms. Others agree with this, but then have pointed out that since appreciating it is not biologically useful, like feeding or shagging, it merely parasitizes or abuses these pathways. Music is a useless exploitation of reward pathways that should be busy responding to activities concerned with survival, feeding, sex, etc. The cognitive psychologist Stephen Pinker has compared music to auditory cheesecake to give pleasure to, the, to a brain used to turning sound into meaning. Zator's observation that those shivers down the spine seem to support this idea. Useless music is linked with other biologically relevant survival related stimuli by the common recruitment of brain circuitry involved in pleasure and reward. Singing is auditory masturbation and if music vanished from the world this would have little significance. The St. Matthew Passion, it appears, is a long communal hand job. Thanks to neuroscience, J.R. Spark has now been unmasked as the Hugh Hefner of the 18th century. <laughs> For others, however, music is more than a hitchhiker on biological mechanisms. It has a biological purpose. And this claim is supported by the seeming observation that the love of music is widespread through the animal kingdom. And the conclusion that we humans, like other beasts, are hardwired to enjoy it. The hardest wiring is supposed to be found in those oldest parts of the brain, such as the striatum, which we share with other beasts. Evolutionary theorists of music focus on the musical tastes of whales, elephants that play drums, cockatoos that dance, songbirds that appreciate a clarinet, and Franz Kafka didn't make it up after all in his little story, Josephine the Singing Mouse, the ultrasound songs of courting mice. 
The overwhelming evidence, however, is that our musical tastes are not hardwired. And those few universals of musical tastes that can be extracted from the huge variety of pieces that people enjoy are remote from the stunning singularity of works in a particular genre. Musical appreciation is dependent on culture, memory, mood, and many other factors such as personal taste. Stuart Kelly reminds us of the obvious when he says that each of us brings to a work of art our own histories, memories, connotations and partialities. We are not blank canvases onto which art is flung or empty vessels into which it is poured. Responses to culture and cultural objects are not only conditioned by our background but change over time. Your favourite artist at 16 is unlikely to be your favourite artist at 47. And it's not unknown for people to argue vigorously in defence of their taste in music for reasons that may have little to do with their dopaminergic pathways. Nevertheless, the biologizers seem to have a little more going for them when we consider the creation as opposed to the appreciation of music. After all, there is the striking example of those extraordinary crooners that fly through the air and perch on our rooftops and give us such pleasure in the spring. And doesn't birdsong have an obvious function in sexual selection, a technique by which males sing signal to the female populace that they are an excellent genetic prospect. But are birds really musicians like us? The differences between birdsong and human music making are many and fundamental. First of all, the creation and or performance of music in birds is universal, at least in males, and not confined to a few. In animals, there is no division of labor between a talented minority of producers and a majority of consumers. How different this is from the situation in humans, set out by Levi Strauss in the passage quoted earlier, that music is a language by whose means messages are elaborated that can be understood by the many, but sent out only by the few. If you are a male bird, you sing. It is a biological imperative. What's more, the behavior is switched on automatically. And there's no difference between creation, rehearsal, and performance. There's no laborious practicing or acquisition of the craft of the instrument. The instruments are bodily parts that grow rather than being manufactured. Nor on the art of composition. No active conscious learning. No teachers and mentors, though of course there is evidence of imitation. The modes of cooperation that we see in human mu music making, the choir, the quartet, the band, loose elective associations formed to work together are not seen in birdland. And of course singing in birds is diurnal and seasonal, but not so in humans, precisely in the case of birds because it's directly connected with sexual selection. If musical creation humans were about sexual selection, difficult to see why I, a man, admire and worship, indeed, certain male performers. Why I will queue for hours to listen to them, and indeed, why they played such an important part in my own courtship ri rituals. Why my wife-to-be and I went to concerts together to listen to other males, and indeed to females. Why would I put a rival songster to myself on a pedestal and shell out for two tickets to hear him at the South Bank? As for the artist and the role of music in sexual selection, well, of course, some artistic performers do indeed seem to be extraordinarily promiscuous. But this is more a question of opportunity. What's more, they seem less keen on gene spreading and child reading, rearing than on copulation without issue. In most cases, however, the career of a musician makes active anti-biological sense. In short, it is worse than spreading one's seed on the ground. There is the love of the craft and of the medium for its own sake that drives the pursuit of an idea of perfection, from which, which from the evolutionary point of view is a waste of time, effort and breath. Secondly, there are much easier ways for humans to advertise their genetic health in a manner that will attract females and ensure the replication of one's genes, namely by indulging in fist fights or by making loads of money. Besides, though this seems to be missed by many biologists of art, many artists, by the way, are female. Talking of women, when did you last see a blackbird invite a female to sing along with him? And the dawn chorus is a chorus only to the human listeners, and only the human listeners enjoy it. For the female, if you believe the story, it is a serious business of checking out a partner. This notwithstanding, the science of the neurobiology of creativity, in which a propensity to artistic creation 
is said to be planted in our brains for adaptive purposes is a growth industry. The results of this neurobiology of creativity are predictably meagre, based on experiments that are remote from the actual processes of musical composition. At any rate, they have very little to say about the creation of music, a process of vision and revision that even in the case of the peerlessly fluent Franz Fran Schubert could sometimes take weeks, a rather long time, perhaps to have one's head in a brain scan. Studies of brain circuits for creativity usually focus only on minimally creative tasks, such as thinking of the things one can do with the letter A, which would have one could do with a brick, rather, or listing places starting with the letter A, which would have little relevance to the kind of creativity that is in play when the eerily beautiful tune of Death and the Maiden is being transformed into the movement of a quartet opening up new kinds of musical space. The often repeated claim that creativity involves lessening of, inability, uh, sorry, lessening of inhibition on novelty seeking and that this is due to activities of bits of the brain such as the right parietal cortex tells us absolutely nothing. Novelty per se is not unique to original art. It is also present in random movements. Artistic innovation takes place against a background of established rules and a feeling for a genre. The extraordinary sense, the exquisite artistic, artistic tact that enables great composers to choose enriching innovations as opposed to merely distracting ones, creating new harmonies out of seeming dissonance is not visible to brain watchers. After all, structures such as the parietal cortex are universal, operating in musically untalented individuals like me, as well as in a handful of Schubert's that the world has seen. And many of their characteristic patterns of discharge are, by the way, also seen in monkeys, whose contribution to the development of Western music, so far as I know, is fairly modest. Observation of electrical activity in the non-historic general brain will tell us nothing about why the twelfth child of seemingly ordinary Viennese parents was able at the beginning of the 19th century to compose a profusion of works that have transformed the possibility of music and the way we feel about the world we live in. And the mystery of musical, as opposed to other forms of creativity, is particularly striking, if only because so few of us are able even to get to first base. Pretty well anyone can write a third-rate poem or draw a passable picture but only a minority can compose even a tenth-rate string quartet. So such, such thoughts might enable us to take a perspective on Jonah Lehrer's characteristic boast that biology is now casting, casting light on creativity and the imagination. For the first time in human history, he says, it is possible to learn how the imagination works. Instead of relying on myth and superstition, we can think about dopamine and dissent, the right hemisphere and social networks. Well, this is an example of the BS that is propagated by those for whom brain science must be the key to humanity, which is where we must seek the meaning and significance of music. It's time now, however, to move on from point-missing technology-driven neurobiological approaches to music to look at music itself, which will give us some idea of what will be necessary if science is going genuinely to advance our understanding of music. I want to talk about the meaning and significance of music in particular and the arts in general. Neuroesthetics, by getting so much wrong about them, may help by default enable us to see the nature of the aesthetic tendency in humankind. Appreciating that we can't understand art unless we acknowledge that it is an expression of a uniquely human mode of consciousness is a start. Now that uniqueness has many aspects, and I can touch on them only very briefly. We have a unique degree of freedom, a unique mode of awareness which we can broadly call knowledge, and arising out of the latter, hungers that only humans feel. And it is as a response to these hungers, and in a celebration of this freedom, that art arises. And it's here we must search for its meaning. I want to say a little bit about each of these things. First of all, art is an expression of and a response to our freedom. A freedom that is in part measured by the distance we have opened up from the exigencies of the natural world and from the immersion of an organic body in a natural environment. 
It is the supreme expression of the way that we take the biological givens and we make them something entirely different, as when we turn breathing into singing or into playing a wind instrument. This is possible because we operate from a space, the human world, which is in many respects quite apart from nature. It is a semiosphere, sphere, a sphere of signs and complex meanings and norms and institutions that is quite different from the biosphere, which of course we share with animals. It is a place of acknowledged, collective and evolving explicit meanings. We're not organisms, we're embodied subjects related to a world of objects that are explicitly other than us. And in that sense, we're uncoupled from the world. We truly face the world. We can know the world from a distance. It's revealed to us from a distance. Vision, of course, is the primordial and most immediately apparent example of that awareness at a distance. So, to develop the idea of art as an expression or celebration of uniquely human freedom, let me switch momentarily from music to painting and consider the unique freedom of the human gaze. Our gaze, when we look at the world, is consciously offset from the world. We're not dissolved into it or tethered to what we see. As Heidegger said, like no other creatures, we face the world. And so we have the possibility of elective or recreational looking. So let's consider in a very simple-minded way how that might develop into visual art. Think of a painting. It is an iconic sign of part of or something in the visual world. It's not simply a mirror image, of course. Few, if any, representations are mirror images. But most importantly for the present discussion, art widens the separation between the one who sees and that which is seen, and hence widens the margin, margin of freedom granted to the onlooker. When I look at you over there, I'm separated from you, but still, as it were, spatially connected to you, potentially interacting with you. If, on the other hand, I were to look at a picture of you in an art gallery, that would be a further layer of separation, and the connection would be of a different order, more tenuous, more on my terms. When what is seen is transferred from its primary setting in a visual field to a wall, as in rock art, or to a gallery, it is more securely established as an object purely for recreational seeing. When I see a tiger in a picture, I don't feel moved to run away, and the painted clouds in a Monet don't prompt me to check whether I have my umbrella with me. Art is about seeing for the sake of seeing, and realizing to the full the potential freedom of the seer. Now that's very simple and very fast, but I hope it's sufficient to indicate the size and nature of the distance between art on the one hand and the biology of the organism, Homo sapiens, on the other. And of course this applies with even greater force to literary art, given that the relationship between the word and its referent is not a straightforward one of spatial proximity. Words can be used to signify objects, independently of their actual or even possible presence. This allows an expansion of freedom that is potentially limitless. Although for the most part we use words instrumentally, they may be detached from use and enjoy for their own sake and for the reference they may invoke, as in literature. Paul Valéry, the great French poet and thinker, was once asked to specify the difference between poetry and prose. I would say it's the difference between literary discourse and all, all other discourse. He said, it's like the difference between walking and dancing. You walk to get somewhere and you dance to enjoy movement for its own sake. Of course, activity undertaken for its own sake is shared with sport and other recreations. When people are running around like lunatics on a rugby pitch, that is clearly enjoyment of movement itself. But what art has to offer is a connectedness that these other, these other recreations don't offer. But that's a more complex story. I want now to move on from human freedom to knowledge. Knowledge takes a unique form in humans, to the point where we may say that man is the only animal that truly has knowledge. And I've discussed it, I'm afraid to say, at great length in this book, and indeed in pitiless detail, which is part of the trilogy I think I referred to me in previous talk. 
But our knowledge transcends anything that's revealed by experience. Though it is, of course, subjected, as the American philosopher Quine said, to the tribunal of experience. And very little of our knowledge is utilized to shape our behavior at a given time. We have a huge deposit account of knowledge which is rarely mobilized in the current account of, it, of, of everyday activity. But there are many consequences of our being knowing animals as opposed to merely experiencing and reacting animals. The most obvious is that our freedom is extended and we have enhanced power to act through sharing of experience and sharing of expertise. That's the upside. But there's a downside. As knowing animals in possession of facts, we are aware that we are a small part of something much bigger than us. We are awake to our true condition. We know that the world will outlast us. As our sense of history and of space and time grows, so our awareness of our insignificance intensifies. And this sharpens our knowledge of our own mortality. Man, as far as we know, is the only animal that can see his life as finite and can actively fear death in the abstract as well as when it is facing him in some concrete form. And the other consequence of knowledge is that our experiences are, as it were, eaten away from within. We are distracted from looking, say, by thinking or merely ruminating. We are frequently mentally not where we are physically. And one manifestation of this is we have the idea of experiences that actual experience may not live up to. From knowledge arises our sense of having insufficient reason for our existence and of living a life, even when it goes well, even when we're fortunate enough to be well above the poverty line, of living a life of incomplete meanings. We are, even if intermittently aware, that we are contingent creatures who will die by virtue of the same accidents that brought us into being. We are accidents waiting to unhappen. Which brings me to the third unique feature of humans, relevant to our understanding of the nature and function of art. Hunger. We have basic hungers that are plainly rooted in biological necessity, as in the hunger for food and for drink and so on. And then there are more complex hungers for pleasure that may take their rise from biological pressures, such as gourmet eating and the infinite varieties of recreational sex. But there are others, such as stamp collecting, that express something rather remote from biology. Then there is a third kind of human hunger. Hunger for acknowledgement by others, for acknowledgement by consciousness equal to our own, that is expressed most, cle most clearly in filial, parental or romantic, romantic love. A hunger, of course, that Hegel wrote about at great length and Sartre after him. And finally, there is a hunger for the completion of meaning, for something that would offset the effects of our knowledge that throws our assumption of our importance into question and eats into our experiences with the idea of perfected experience. Now, I develop these ideas in more detail in a little monograph called Hunger. But it's here or hereabouts that we need to look to understand the meaning, the significance, and the nature of art in general, and music in particular. The freedom that comes from knowledge and the wound in our consciousness that arises out of knowledge are both addressed by art. The freedom is celebrated, the wound, if temporarily, is healed. Art is experience enjoyed for its own sake and perfected for its own sake. And this has nothing to do with what matters in the natural world, nothing to do with what is of evolutionary advantage, nothing to do with the kind of thing that would be inscribed in the structure and function of the standalone evolved brain. And this is where art is relevant. It matters to us, or we need it, because we have woken to a greater or lesser extent, out of the state of an organism. Half awakened, we endeavor to find a unifying, or at least non-local significance in our lives. Significance often remains tantalizingly incomplete and stubbornly local, and insufficient to address what we know about ourselves. And at times, this may open up the feeling that we've not fully realized that we exist, not fully realized the scale and scope of what we are and of the world we live in and a consequent ache to shake off an existential numbness, to be truly awake, alert, and alive. So art is about experience perfected for its own sake, celebrating freedom, addressing the wound at the heart of human consciousness, the life we live, and it has nothing to do with anything of evolutionary advantage 
that I say could be inscribed in the structure and function of the general brain. Now let's just now return briefly to music to see how art, art might address our sense of being insufficiently there, of our experiences in being some, in some sense, in some respects, unsatisfactory or hollowed out from within. And I want to focus on two aspects of music that celebrate and exploit our freedom and do something towards repairing the ache at the heart of consciousness that arises out of the knowledge that gave us our freedom. I want to focus on feelings and emotions on the one hand and on the other, form. In great music, feelings and form are as inseparable as the recto and verso of a sheet of paper. Let me begin with emotions. In us, as in animals, emotions are physiological storms. And as in animals, they may be a response to a particular stimulus. But in us, not in animals, they are more, much more than this. One way, not entirely satisfactory, of capturing this more is to say that human emotions are a way of understanding or being attuned to a world. Indeed, some emotions, joy or depression or fear or hopefulness, may be free-floating and not have a particular trigger. Or they may exceed the particular trigger and become the coloration of an outlook. As the great French philosopher Henri Bergson said, emotions are a means of our orientation, of our awareness to the past and future. Emotions deepen our temporal depth, widening the window through which we look at the world. Art serves the purpose of deepening the joy that looks to the future and the sadness that looks to the past. In music which can be meaningful or significant, without being about anything in particular, we have emotions disconnected from specific stimuli, except the stimulus of the music itself. Liberated in this way from local causes, the emotions in it are purified, transformed. Unlike the raw stuff of everyday feelings, the sadness of a slow movement in a symphony is not contaminated with tears that make cosmetics run and mucus flow. The music's own exquisite architecture confers a structure, even a narrative structure, on the evolution of feelings. How music evokes feelings is entirely unknown, because unlike physiological phenomena, they have a boutness. They are about the world we're in. This aboutness has its ultimate origin in the intentionality that I spoke of in my earlier talk. So much for emotions. What about form? In a piece of music, each note is fully present as an actual physical event. And yet, because the music realizes a form that shapes expectation and assists recall, their individual notes are manifestly and explicitly part of a larger whole. There is no conflict, therefore, between the form or idea of the music and its actual instance. Our moments of listening are imbued with a sense of what is to come and what is ha ha has passed. The form to which the music conforms that ties what has gone with what is to come, and these with each other and with what is present, shines through its individual moments. There is both movement and stillness. The unfolding sound realizes form as, to use Aristotle's phrase, the moving unmoved, or indeed, the unmoving moved. The large scale and small scale connectedness within a piece of music breaks the tyranny of and then, and then, and then, the endless skidding of experience onto the next thing. And this is scaled up when we link our successive experiences of a piece and the memories that come with our experience of the piece and with other pieces in the same, jo same genre or from the same composer. With our growing understanding of what has been achieved in the vast archive of transmitted perfected sound, perfected sound. Truly it has been said that art, in this case music, is a machine for the conquest of time. So we have experience perfected, fully experienced, and the wound in human consciousness, if only temporarily, filled. As you heard Emmanuel once put it, music creates order out of chaos, for rhythm imposes unanimity upon diversity, melody imposes continuity upon the disjointed, and harmony imposes compatibility on the incongru incongruous. Chaos, diversity and unity, and disjointedness are hardly matters of preoccupation even to our nearest primate cousins, the chimps, 
whom I doubt suffer from a sense of the unsatisfactory nature of their experiences. Well, it's time to end. To quote Humphrey Littleton, I hear the tortoise of time exploding in the microwave of eternity. <laughs> I just comment that this talk is unsatisfactory in many respects, most of which I'll be unconscious of, but the two of which I'm, specific, I'm very conscious. Firstly, that I've been sketchy on the differences between man and other animals. And secondly, that I've been equally sketchy on the nature and purpose of art, particularly in music. But regarding the first, I hope I've said enough for you to at least be willing to concede that there is a huge difference between us and beasts, perhaps even as great as the neuroscientist Ramachandran suggested, namely that humanity trans -apehood, transcends apehood to the same degree by which life transcends mundane chemistry and physics. And regarding the second, that I have at least said enough about the nature of, your, of, of art for you to entertain the possibility that it is driven by concerns remote from those that preoccupy animals, remote from those that are suitable subjects for neurobiology as it is present constituted. So we may draw two conclusions about the neuro neurobiological approaches to music. They bypass its essential character and they will miss something fundamental about our unique human nature from which music and the other arts take their rise. But for me, this is a reason to rejoice, not ground for gloom. It suggests the possibility of a new kind of departure, perhaps even a joint enterprise in which biological sciences and the arts and the humanities think how they might work together on equal terms. This means that they have to communicate in different ways, in different ways from those indicated by hybrid pseudodisciplines such as neuroesthetics. And even more interestingly, to drive us to think harder about the ways we humans are unique and how, given the theory of evolution, how we became unique. And in pursuit of this, we need to avoid two pitfalls. The theological error of exaggerating our differences from the rest of the animal kingdom and of denying our similarities. And the, uh, the error from biologism of denying our differences and exaggerating our similarities. Only in this way will we, will we be properly embarked on the great intellectual adventure of the 21st century to develop a clearer, more truthful, and rounder view of what ma manner of being we humans are. As to this, music seen aright might give us some insights. In the meantime, it seems perfectly reasonable to concur with Levi Strauss that music is a language by whose means messages are elaborated that can be understood by the many but sent out only by the few, and that it unites the contradic contradictory character of being at once intelligible and untranslatable. It may not make us gods, but it certainly may brings us closer to the gods than our chaffinches. In Schubert's case, we have a god even more deserving of our thanks for overcoming the indignities, disappointments, endless illnesses, and frustrations of his life overcoming them to give us a multitude of glimpses of the heaven fashioned out of the sounds he heard in his head. Thank you.